Let's ride! Right, three, two, one. I might be set up here. You know, I'm, I'm really optimistic. Come and uh, have a chin wag with me. First and foremost, we need to create American heroes out of the American day. I saw glimpses of what it's going to be and that really excites, not just me, it excites the players. All the challenges of COVID and all the challenges that we've had with World Rugby and the changing game. I think 2021 is going to be even bigger and even better. Welcome back to the next episode of Pathways with the New England Freedracks. I'm your host, Tom Kindly, and I'm very lucky to have two rock stars of the USA national game um, of world rugby uh, in general. And I'll do a quick rundown on uh, the bios, which are dictionary length long. Here yeah, we've got Gary Gold, obviously USA rugby national team coach, former Worcester Warriors rugby director, uh, DOR rather, Sharks head coach, Bath head coach and DOR and Springboks assistant coach, among very, uh, many other roles as well. And we've got Greg, USA rugby assistant coach, Rooney head coach, Island women's attack coach, and Yale DOR. Gentlemen, welcome along, and thanks so much for making the time. Thanks, Tom. Good to be here. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And Greg, I, I do want to start, mate, and Gary, I want to enlighten you with, with one of my fondest sort of rugby moments and it was actually this year just been and it was our first first game within major league rugby and it, and it was actually the final whistle of the 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 first of the cold wars officially uh and i was looking down at sam Boyd stadium in las vegas and we're just we're just obviously we're victorious in that great battle there and i look over to the cage with you know there was the lizard and and the other animals in the enclosure and Greg's in there, and and just I, I have to say, Greg, that did give me a lot of satisfaction, mate. I might be set up here. Is that, <laughs> it's getting hard to set me up. Listen, I'm, that's okay. That's okay, Tom. We uh, we accept that we were the second best team that day, and uh, trust me, we were very excited to welcome you back to New York uh, for the second game. So uh, next year can't come quickly enough. And thank you for having right. me on the show. Very happy to be here. No, thank you so much, Drew, for being here. And uh, in fairness to you guys, you did have a Ford pack that were all domestic compared to ours, which was like the New England Barbarians, as I know you like to point out from time to time. Yeah, it's good. I, I thought you guys started off well in the league. Uh, that was by far our worst uh, performance. But, you know, in fairness to our players, they owned it. And they got better as the five games went on. And I think we have good momentum now going into next year, like yourselves. So just excited to get back out and, and get training and get playing. And uh, I'm excited now for 2021. Yeah, Funny. spot on, Greg. And, mate, I do, I do want to say before we get cracking here, just condolences from, you know, and all the best from from the Free Jacks uh, world up in New England for everything going on with your family at the moment. and. We are very proud of the way that your family's handling circumstances and we're, we're certainly here for you throughout the whole time. So, mate, from, from us to you, um, always looking out for you. Yeah, no, the support from, you know, Mags and the rest of your staff and some of your players, uh, just reaching out and just sending texts is, uh, is nice. So, no, we really appreciate it. So, uh, thanks very much. Good man. Gary, how, how's uh, quarantine treating you over in South Africa? I'm sure you're busy plotting away for what's next for USA rugby side of events. Um, how are you? Yeah, good, good. It's uh, as lockdowns go. It can. It, it's been a good one. Um, I, I think it's uh, going to be a massive learning curve for many of us in our lives to come. We're going to reflect on this bizarre last couple of months in our lives and. Um, yeah, I think it, it's like most things in life, it's it's what you make of it. And I hope in hindsight, looking back at it now, you know, manage, managing to get out of the US on that very last week uh, of, of February, in fact, the last day of February to, to get home to my family was fortuitous. Um, didn't anticipate to be here this long. Obviously, was, you know, had lots of plans to be back. We're supposed to be back in, in the US on the 1st of April and haven't been back yet. So... But it's been it's been a busy time. It's been a, a real busy time. We've you know tried to interact with the players a lot, but there's been a lot going on. Obviously, uh, it's no secret that there's a lot of changes at USA Rugby, um, and you know that's coincided with all the all the challenges of COVID and all the challenges that we've had with World Rugby and the changing game and the change of chairmanship at World Rugby. So it's um, 
as I say, when, when it rains, it storms. And it's certainly been a, a hell of a storm over the last couple of months. But, uh, you know, I think there'll be a lot of good that comes out of it. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a false optimist, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really optimistic about the changes that I think can come, not only in the world game, but I'm really excited about that, um, you know, the new broom can sweep clean in the USA rugby. And, and, and I think we can get a lot of positive changes and, and uh, yeah, when all hands are back on deck, then then we're gonna have to really make a go of it. But but you know, none none more so exciting than than what you guys do at MLR, you know. And thank thank goodness for you guys because I think you guys are are, are certainly becoming the uh, the bedrock of, of of the game in in the United States. Thank goodness. And obviously, what we're here to talk about primarily today. But you know, thank goodness we've got an, an MLR that's now at least a, a couple of years old, two and a half years old. And, um, you know, reasonably well established and from the looks of things, um, jumping at the book bit to get back next year when, when rugby is going to be up and running again. So, so all good. I think a lot of good will come out of it. Good man, Gary. And you've touched on some good points there and sort of that overarching principle of this will be the pathway from and into the international game and what Major League Rugby does for the international game and for specifically the international USA team. Um, Let's bounce ideas and talk about, you know, the standard of Major League Rugby this past year the, from the, the five rounds that did take place. What, what were your thoughts? Let's start with Greg from, from your side of things. What were your thoughts on the competition? I loved it. Um, I think it's a great, you know, to Gary's point, I think it's a brilliant product. I think it's got so much potential, um, both from a playing, coaching, administrative supportive community point of view i mean what we can do through the mlr they are the bedrock of i believe um of our pathway where you know local players come through high schools the club uh, they go to university and and they become members of uh, the club game so you know the likes of mystic the likes of old blue and from there then they they move on to mlr um so i i saw I saw glimpses of what it's going to be, and that really excites not just me. It excites the players. It excites uh, it excites us in the office. And I think the key thing is how can we excite the supporters now to get behind it to really kick it forward. Um, yeah, and I think like Gary, you know, you have a chance to look at yourself and really reflect for the first time in a while. Certainly for me personally, and there's a lot of things that you know I'm excited to get out and improve on because there's areas I felt you know need improving and. I'm just really excited to, to get out there and try and innovate with uh, the coaching staff and have some fun. No, I, I love that, Greg. And I, I think you've touched on a good point is that, you know, people forget that it, it is a business and you've got to get bums on seats and you've got to get people keen to come along and, and tuned in and, and you've got to innovate, like you mentioned. And how, how do you guys do that in New York? And, and how do you think we can do that better as a league in general? How can we excite? And, you know, you're seeing some, some leagues around the world slowly starting to, I hate to use the word, but potentially die in the championship and even, you know, might attend to an extent. How can we excel? I mean, it's my opinion, but I think the fact that, um, you know, the MLR was able to pay all the players 100% of their wages uh, for the year shows the strength of the league and the importance of having a, a very stable financial model that can last for years on years. I think that's very very important to have first and foremost. So I think like from my point of view, anything that has stability um, has growth uh, if you have the right people in place. And uh, yeah, certainly, certainly I think it's going to be an interesting time ahead. And um, I, I think it's, we're in the entertainment game, you know, that's our job is people want to come and watch and be entertained. And at the moment, I think, so much has changed now, even the last 10 years. You know, people don't want to watch golf anymore. They don't want to watch cricket. They don't want to sit down for four hours. They want everything instantaneously. That's the way the world is moving. So I think we need to create a product for America that fits what the people want, which is, you know, maybe throwing the ball around a little bit. Um, but, you know, you've also got to win, particularly for New York. And I, I think you're seeing some teams, I don't know, Gary, if you've noticed, I know we talked briefly when we met in Atlanta, we are beginning to see certain teams play certain ways and, and begin to form their DNA. And I think New York is still trying to search for our DNA, but you know, we have a rough idea of, of the way that we want to play the game and the players that we feel are able to play that way. And I, I think we need to make sure it's entertaining and, and engaging with the community as, as we've talked about before, Tom. So 
you know, there'll be a lot of work to do and there's a lot of really good people in all the clubs who are prepared to do it. So I'm excited for, for the next few years to see what comes out of it. And let's talk about the, uh, the foreign limit. Uh, you know, there's a lot of conversation about that. What is the thought of, of you guys on the foreign cap limit with where it is and, and how does that lend itself to the, to the standard of the game? Are you directing that to me or Gary? Either or. Um, do, you, do you want to take this, Gary? Or do you want me to start? Um, I'm happy to take it. Um, again, Tom, you know, at the, at the outset of this call, you said, you know, you wanted us to to be as candid as possible, and I'll be very candid about this. I mean, I think we've all we've both sung the praises of the MLR in the last five, ten minutes, and, and whilst I'm massively excited about the prospect of it, and I'm not only excited about it, I mean, it, it's a lifeline for USA Rugby, in my opinion. Um, I do have to say, though, that there's one or two red flags. We have to be very careful about what those red flags are. And I know initially you may be thinking that I'm coming only from a USA point of view, but you asked the question about, you know, you'd mentioned the championship earlier. I've, I've coached in, in, in a couple of countries, none more so than the UK. And, you know, I, I do think the warning signs, you know, are there if we're going to learn from history. And, and there's two fundamental warning signs. First and foremost, we need to create American heroes. You know, out of the American game, um, we 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 can buy a couple of, of of big name players, and that'll be fantastic if you do that, and that will lend to the product. But there's a balance, so the the, the limit on the foreign players has got to be very well kept because you don't want to be um, you don't want to be stifling um, your own homegrown players. Number one, and number two, to the point that was made by both of you a little bit earlier, if the MLR as an organisation are going to put some rules into place, and you were talking about how do we sustain the league? Greg's, to, to Greg's point, which is hugely va valid about the fact that during a pandemic and a crisis situation, the league will be able to pay the players. You're only able to do that because the clubs at this moment in time, by and large, are abiding by the salary cap. And there's no point in having a salary cap. Don't try and look for the shortcuts. Don't, don't try and, and, and cut corners. If you're going to have a salary cap and you're going to have a team that's in the MLR, stick to the thing. Don't, don't muck about it around it because if you will find a way. There are millions of ways. And if you want to do that and one big entrepreneur comes along, he could literally blow the whole league, he or she could blow the whole league apart. So just be, be, be mindful of, you know, those are key criteria in, in, in terms of being able to make a, a, a league sustainable and, and a competition that's, you know, that's homegrown fundamentally. Um, obviously, it's outstanding that you can, you, you know, can bring in the foreign stars. Um, but again, I say with all the best respect in the world, I, I'm, I'm not sure how many American rugby paying um, um, supporting public know, know the list of, 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 of world class players. You know, I think, you know, with respect, they, they might know the top 10 or 20 players in the world. And there's very few clubs that can afford those players at this moment in time, especially if you're going to get them at the height of the game. So um, I think the potential is, is absolutely huge. I just think that the management of the, of the league and the organization, we, we, we need to keep it, well, the MLR need to keep it, and USA Rugby in collaboration with them need to keep a very tight hold on that because um, then, then it can really grow from strength to strength. And again, it, it's, you've also got to understand the dynamics, which I appreciate not a lot of people do, but if you're a new team in and you, you, you know, you're having to pay your way, you're having to pay your way for a certain amount of rights and you want to know that those rights are going to be sacred and they're going to be looked after. Um, and, and, and so I think that that's, that's, a, that's a very important point to, to take into consideration. And then by and large, this is an American product. And uh, while the three of us sitting on this call aren't American, we do need to respect the fact that it's an American product and that we need to add value to that as an American product, especially if we're privileged enough like the three of us are to be able to work in this country. So we need to lend to that in, in a very big way. I feel quite strongly about that, you know. And, and again, it's not only just a, a, a hidden agenda of mine, you know. I mean, I very well may end up coaching the MLR one day, you know. I, I'm not going to change my views on that. You know, even though I would, like Greg has, has a need to win, TK, you guys have a need to win. Every one of the teams in the MLR have got a need to win and they've got ambitious owners and, and that's fantastic. But I do think it's very important that we need to keep a very strict hand on it. And it's not something that we shouldn't have to police. It, it should be something that's important enough to all the owners and all the people um, in the game to, to be able to protect it. Because all that's really going to happen is one or two individuals can ruin it for everybody else if, if, you, blow the, if you blow the league out of the water by, by not being able to stick to those criteria.
I think it's important from that point of view. And I, and I, and there's a couple of countries out there that have that are really leading lights, you know. And dare I say it, you know, probably none more so than Ireland, you know. And I mean, I, I know a player that I coached many years ago, but he was in something like his eighth or ninth season. He was an absolute legend at one of the Irish provinces, and he was let go after his eighth season at the province because he was blocking the pathway of the next nine that was coming through the pathway who was Irish qualified. So. Um, again, you know, it's not a coincidence that Irish rugby are sitting where they are at the moment, you know, and there, there is a model that works out there and uh, it's a very stringent model and if we stick to it, USA rugby can can do what Jap- Japan rugby did in a, in a relatively short space of time. We can we can improve dramatically, but we, we, we need you guys, you know, and the clubs and that's why I'm so optimistic about the MLR really because I think that's uh, the quickest way to be able to develop USA rugby. It's a... Uh... So, like, I, I agree with that. The, the one thing that does concern me as well is, you know, it's the law of diminishing marginal returns. It's what becomes too many national domestic players. So, for example, you take the Irish system, G, that have 200 professional players. And of the 200 professional players, I think 80 of them would be either sub-academy or academy players, leaving around 120 pros in Ireland. And each province would have a certain amount of foreigners, probably down to about 100 players in Ireland are actually pros who are Irish. And that comes through like a wide funnel base at a very early age. And they have these moments throughout their playing where they're tested and um, they make their way to the next level. And that funnel gets short and they get a really good product at the end. Um, so if you take you know, Ireland around that 100 professional players, on any given week in America in the MLR, you'll have 168 plus professionals playing in the league. It's about getting the balance right because a lot of those professionals maybe started playing when they were in college. They might only have just started playing. They're crossover players. They need a lot of developing. It's about getting the right amount of foreigners versus Americans to make sure the product is still a good product that people are excited about watching. So I think like we saw in the UK, gee, like in the late 90s, when it went professional, you need a certain amount of foreign influx. And then when the thing begins to settle and you have the academies in place and you have the pathways in place, they become less reliant on the foreigners and more reliant on homegrown talent. So the national team, while it's great to have 168 plus Americans playing each week, realistically, I mean, we'll say we'll look at 168, but they'll funnel down to what will eventually be your best between 40 and 50 players, right? Yeah, it's great. You're 100% right, but you must take into consideration you're talking about four teams in Ireland. Yeah, exactly. About 12 or 13 exactly. clubs. Yeah. So it, it, it's, still, it's still really, per Irish province, it's still average of 25 players. Now, yeah. how many guys have you got in your squad, in your larger squad, including your academy in the Rooney? Uh, we have 39. With 30 so, 39, so if, if you were to work on the rule of thumb and say 25 would be American-based, we pretty yeah. much have those numbers, and that's why we need to keep it there. The, yeah. Where the attention to detail comes in is in key positions. So there, there's key positions that where where you really do need to ensure that we are, we being USA Rugby, are four, five, or six deep in those key positions. And then obviously many players, and the way the modern rugby players going at the moment now, very many of them are. You know, you know, can play in a in, in number of different positions now, yeah. you know, especially the way the modern game is going at the moment. So that makes the player more versatile. But I, I agree with you. I 100% agree with you. And look, it's, it's easier to monitor in Ireland. You know, the IRFU basically yeah. manage all the players. They own all the players. And there's four provinces that you – there's really four provinces that you that you manage in. Whereas, whereas your point's well taken, but – uh, again, you know, if it's well, if it's a well-managed situation, you've got 25, and you've got that at 13 MLL clubs or 14, however many they're going to be next year, you could be in a very healthy situation. And I think that's where everybody talks about, you know, the potential strength of USA rugby. But it's not going to happen unless that's well managed. But your point's very valid. I mean, it's just it's looking across the Irish game and have a look at the impact and and the ma- the amazing thing about the example I'm going to give you now, it was a win, but. The impact Doug Harlett made when he was at Munster, or the impact Scott right. Hardy's that's, made. That's my, goal. That, that, that's my goal. I know it's Tom's goal that, like, when, when you, we bring in foreigners, we're bringing in players who play the game at a good level, who are going to just have so much wisdom to give young players coming out of college. So, 
you know, we, like last year, will be signing a lot of players coming out of college. Um, and the goal is that they come in as development players and you have players who are able to teach them around the game much more than we can as coaches. Uh, so, like, they have a value. And again, I, I agree with you. It's about getting that balance right to make sure that we have the right amount of Americans in the league that are getting the funnel towards the national sides at 20s, selects and at senior level and then to have the right foreigners in like Man Nanu for example a perfect case in San Diego who famously there was a Wednesday one of the first weekends that he'd been there where the guys were all going surfing and he's like we're, we're training today and and the player's like oh I'm not training today have a day off and he goes you don't have a day off so he went in and he just do some extras you know for 45 minutes he'd, he'd do some stretching it's those little tiny things that can have a really good influence and that that for me is what we need because we've so many players who have a young training age because a lot of them have only crossed over in college. So the more education they can get into how to have a good lifestyle around the game, the better those players will be through, I suppose, being accelerated into that environment and hopefully they can perform. So yeah, the, the part I really like about what you said there, Greg, is, is, is realistically there's only a certain amount, us as a group of, and us, by us I mean MLR and national level coaches, there's only a handful of us. If you take all of us, including all assistant coaches, analysts, everybody who's important in the management team, there's only a small group of us. Whereas if you start to scatter uh, a Nanu and a Beast and a Rob Short, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you start to filter down that kind of experience. I mean, again, you're talking about a guy who's captain England 68 times or another guy who's played 110 test matches for the All Blacks. That experience, with respect to all of us, there's n- none of us as coaches can impart that. You know, and that's the reason why, you know, those type of players are are incredibly valuable. But but you're spot on. I mean, it it it, it is important to get the right the right individual and the right guy who's gonna who's gonna um, be able to impart that that knowledge yeah, across. Chris, Chris Robshaw just signed for San Diego, as you all know. And I loved, I listened to an interview on the Rugby Pass. And, you know, he talked to the owners and it was very clear that he was coming over, of course, to play and perform. It's a professional winning game, as he mentioned. But a big part of why he's coming over is he's excited to help grow the sport and to help, you know, inspire young kids to play. And there's a lot of kids there. So I just think it's, uh, I think it's in a really healthy position. I think it really is. And um, I think 2021 is going to be even bigger and even better. Yeah. Very well, very well said, guys. And I think you, you touched on a great point, Gary, that there are now there are 13, well, 12 franchises within the States. And if we're all doing our best to everyone is sort of in part trying to build out an academy type system and trying to uh, embed roots into the youth and, and teach the game from the ground up. And, and the biggest issue that we run into, and we probably saw it a bit in the, in the draft, Greg, uh, was the massive difference in disparity and disparity and standard between what these guys play in their collegiate rugby environments and, and their daily training environments to what they're going to have to be expected to to do when they get to major league rugby level. So how can we as major re- league rugby clubs better bridge that gap? Greg, I, I, I don't think I don't think it's through the draft. I think the draft's a great thing. And I'm saying that where New York decided to not take our two draft spots for a foreign place. But to explain, you know, we were number nine and number 21 in the draft. And we feel that as a rugby club, we've got to look, look short term and we have to look long term. We have a very definite long term plan, which is, you know, empire play a big part of that in the community structure. Um, but at the same time, we think that players need development before they can get into you know a match day 23 very few can come out of college and make that straight leap so we're hoping you know i think the more that you can ingrain yourself and it won't it's going to take time um you know get the players younger and try and be able to get them into an environment in college where they're being tested you know through coaches who are asking the right questions and who are conditioning them correctly for the game and are doing the correct skills per position as Gary talks about because it'd be great to have a load of American hookers and scrum halves and tens they're so important as Gary said and we need to have a few heroes so the more that we can get in there and see those young kids early and identify them I think our job as a, as a professional rugby club then is to find a way to have lots of touches with those players uh, to make sure that when they go through high school, we're trying to help them as much as we can and through college, and then they naturally come and play for their local area. I mean, 
you know, while we have foreigners in our clubs, Tom, you know, the hope is, and we've talked about this, that we'll have a lot of Boston, a lot of New Yorkers playing for our clubs in 10, 15 years time, but we need to work our way through a plan to get there. So for now, let's just get as many people playing at an early age where, you know, we can begin to funnel that talent into the MLR, where at the moment, I think it's come from quite a wide base where players haven't been tested in like the right environment. So it's hard to make a call on players, particularly when we were draft number nine, 21. Plus the player that we wanted, we thought was going to get drafted in the top three. So we got very, very lucky to sign the, the one player that we wanted from the draft and Connor Buckley. So it worked out well for us. We got, you know, so, uh, yeah, I, th- I think it's, it's going to evolve. I, I really enjoyed watching the program and, uh, I'm sure next year it'll be different from a New York, New York point of view, but for now it suited us to to take the option that was on the table on the Friday morning. Yeah, and I think we're all on the same page, Greg. We've spoken about it regarding, you know, it's all well and good drafting someone, but you've still got to make sure that they are a going to be able to live in your city yeah. and have have links and have a support network. And if they don't have that, then you're just wasting your time. So it yeah, was like, a great product. Even having a minimal contract that a player can get, and you know, it's hard to get a player across country if they're going to be on an, on a part time contract. They mightn't have somewhere to stay, so it's not quite as easy as just signing a player. There's there's a duty of care for you to that player that you're going to look after them and develop them as an individual as well as a rugby player. So it's got to start off with good integrity, which I'm sure the clubs are doing. Um, yeah. But it is very important that we're true to what the draft is. And in my opinion, it's getting these young players into a professional environment to learn from the seasoned American pros and from the foreigners. And then when they become 23 and 24, I think that's where the American player is going to be hitting a stride where in some European countries or down South, they can be playing at the highest level from 18, 19, but they started playing a lot younger, you see. So it's, it's all relevant, I think. Gary, I, I wanted to ask you, obviously, you know, you know, there's been a, a history of the best American players going offshore. Um, Blaine Scully, you've got Paula CK, Bryce Campbell, and some, some recent ones. What do you think that that ship is sort of turning now? And is MLR becoming a place that those best American players can come back and play at a high standard and, and continue to be considered in the same regard? I, unquestionably. I mean, the fact that you've got a guy like Chris Robshaw who would have had a couple of options, and I and I know he would have had a couple of options out there, um, and and I, you know, controversially or not controversially, I I don't necessarily think he's getting silly money from San Diego. So I don't think it's money. I mean, I think he could have earned a lot more money if he had gone to mainland Europe or he had gone to Japan. No question of a doubt about that. But as Greg alluded to earlier, you know, Chris is very outspoken about the fact that he wanted the experience. He wanted to, you know, finish his last four or five years of playing rugby in terms of making a difference and being able to to lend that expertise. And, you know, thought that there was a lot of, you know, a lot of good intent in the MLR. So I think, you know, guys like Chris and 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 Beast and the guys who have come over. You know, Bastard, who was in New York, and the guys who, who came over, their, their intent was was the correct intent. So I think that has sent a very positive sign. And yes, I do believe that uh, I have had conversations with a handful of senior players, who Eagles players, who already were based in 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 Europe, and and are most certainly looking to come over here. There's there's two issues about it. Is the first thing is the level of the game and the quality of the game, and I think that is that is improving substantially as we speak at the moment now. Clubs have got good level of coaches. I think the environment, certainly I have, I have pretty much attended almost, almost every single MLR environment and I, I'm impressed by it. I mean, it, it has been impressive. Um, the, the level of coaching, the detail has been really good and I think that you can see that's the reason why the competition has improved so substantially year in, year, in and year out. And I, I have no doubt it would have done so this year as well. So there's the level of the quality of the player because the player doesn't want to feel that the gap between playing the highest professional game, in this case MLR and international, is too, is too big. I think that was the case a few years ago in the States. I don't think that is in, in, anymore. And then to a degree, to a degree financially as well. You know, And that's where, I mean, there are initiatives afoot at the moment now from a USA point of view. Once we come out of our dramas as well, we're hopefully going to be able to be in a position where we can collaborate with the MLR and, and, and help that from that point of view, that it, that it works. And 
if that means that USA qualified players, you know, who have been identified, are, are, we can possibly help the clubs with that. You know, then there's an earning capacity as well because a professional player is a professional player for a certain amount of years of his life. It's not a long period of time. It's eight to ten years now. And they're entitled to earn full earning capacity, especially if it's a world-class individual. So, you know, we need to do something to be able to help that without compromising the league. And I think there are solutions around that. So, I mean, I think if we can, if we can understand that those are, those are the criteria that I play to make the competition as good a competition. But, you know, very much like the foreign player, you, you also want your best Eagles players playing at home as well. And I think it's an attractive enough, it's certainly becoming an attractive enough league for the Eagles players to, to want to consider to come back. And, you know, coming back into professional environments where they're going to feel that they are still improving as players. So that's critically important. But just a little bit to go back to your last point, Tom, and, and with the question you asked both Greg and I is, I don't know why this sort of seems to be some form of a secret, because it's not a secret. But in terms of the sustainability, and I'm talking about the financial sustainability, if, I were, if, you, if you're an owner of an MLR club, and the sustainability of the game within the US, it's almost non-negotiable. Uh, and alluding to what Greg was saying about the draft, the draft is going to be one or two players a year that you're going to get, you know, a handful of players. It's hardly even going to be 10% of your squad. The difference is going to be from a financial and a playing development point of view is for each one of these clubs to genuinely be interested in developing decent academies within the organization. And those academies, going back to Greg's point, they've got to tap into the local universities, the local high schools, the local club game within your region that it forms part of. And I think that's really what excites me about the fact that we're going to move to 14 and potentially, I don't know, you guys, the two of you would know better than me, but... You know, it may at one stage get capped at 18 for a handful of years, but a country of, of our size, of the state's size, if we're capping it at 18 or 20 teams and we're playing in two conferences and 20 of those clubs are genuinely going into the grassroots and going to the local high schools, and even if that's spreading a, a radius of 200, 300 miles around and attracting that, that former player, you know, very, very quickly we're going to be able to, to give ourselves a very good product. And you want homegrown. You want homegrown. You want to be going in, in the, the the New England, the Boston area, even a greater area than that. You want to be going in, in spreading your net far and wide and having those guys come through and wanting to play for the Free Jacks one day when they're professionals. But that's really what's going to grow the game. Buying foreigners and draft players, is is is, is it, it's got a place in the game, no question of a doubt. It's not going to be the reason. And very similarly, from our point of view, is the same situation. We need to take into consideration the same situation with with USA a rugby, you know, to find a foreign player who may be in Samoa or in Hawaii or his family have immigrated, that is going to be a very small, that's going to be a very small portion of the amount of players. You know, we have to be doing something to be able to develop the game from within and be developing our youngsters, whether that's through the university system, Ensco, whatever, or club rugby or high school, we, we have to be developing that. That, that, that's terrific, Gary. And, and like, you know, we're, we're talking about being candid here and being transparent. I mean, you know, Steve Lewis has been working very hard with the Empire Union with New York because we've seen that our, our development opportunity is straight away working with the Empire Union, which houses, you know, all of the clubs within New York. So, yeah, it's, very, it's just very important that we get that right. I think for sustainability, it's about getting getting to that level, Gary. Absolutely. Totally agree. And I think, you know, I think we've made a big punch of it the last uh, year and a half, two years. I think the MLO has already done so well for what is a startup. And I think every year it's going to get stronger because to your point, I think it's been governed by people who are smart and who are making good decisions on the fly. And, uh, and yeah, I, I, I'm excited to see what the future holds. And we're probably going to do MLR the justice of giving them a shout out regarding their grassroots initiatives, which they have implemented for next season, which were salary cap incentives mm -hmm. based on having a U19, a U14 and a academy program. So, I mean, I know all the GMs I've spoken to, Greg, you guys included, you guys are all working hard to make sure you guys give yourselves the opportunity to access that extra salary mm -hmm. cap and, and get stuck into the grassroots. All over it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's the way to do it, Tom. I mean, incentivize the clubs for developing grassroots. That That is 
fundamentally the best way to do it. Um, and, and that's where, again, not to tap in the, on, on, on uh, something we've, we've rehashed, but that's the reason why Ireland and New Zealand are where they are at the moment. Breaks my heart to say that to the two of you, but it is unfortunately why Ireland and New Zealand are where they are at the moment now, because they really have got their systems right. And the local clubs and the local provinces or super rugby teams are incentivized by, by bringing these kids through and developing from within. And they get, whether that's financial grants or whether that's salary cap grants, whatever the case may be, is they get incentivized from that point of view. And then, like, to your point, Gary, this is where the exciting role is. I mean, to be involved in rugby at this particular stage and what calls like a business within America, I mean, that for me is the best job in the world, you know. So we can look at Ireland and New Zealand that are different models through intelligence and people getting together and talking in the MLR. Now we're beginning to see how it's working for USA and to think about what we can build in the next couple of years is, uh, yeah, just such an exciting, yeah. such an exciting project. Yeah, great. To be to be clear, I, I'm not at all saying copy New Zealand and Ireland because, as no, I said, no, no. Ireland have got four teams. New Zealand, to all intents and purposes, have got five Super Rugby teams, and then a whole lot for ITM Cup. But so I don't think copy it, but I think learn the lessons of how they develop from within. You know, they're relatively small countries. Well, they are very small countries compared to to what the states are. So, you know, um, but but definitely learn the lessons. I mean, the UK is another very good example. A lot bigger country, but, you know, the, the 12 premiership countries have got huge incentives in terms of uh, um, uh, academy grants and um, salary cap um, uh, relief when they do develop academy players and they get they get additional academy funding and credits for, for being able to develop from within. So, you know, that that's genuinely the route to go from from our point of view you know from the usa point of view and you're right it is it's a very exciting place to be and um you know i i, I think if we all put our heads together and you know as difficult as it always is in, in rugby to park our egos and realize that you know everybody wants to be successful but we don't necessarily have to work against each other to do that and i don't think that's yeah. the case at all with usa rugby and mlr i think the intent is very good i think the dialogue is very open at the moment and uh um, we're not always going to agree on everything. I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure, or the administrators. Thank goodness, none of us are involved at that level. But the administrators aren't always going to agree on everything, and everyone's going to have their own agendas. But by and large, I think uh, you know we'd love the MLR to be one of the most prestigious competitions in the world, and hence that will obviously affect the the effect of how how, how successful the Eagles can be. But it was it, like, for example, as well from your point of view, G, to have you go around the clubs. I mean. People who are listening to this mightn't even realize, but you did like that tour where you, you went, you came to New York for a while, which is great, great seeing you, then to Atlanta. But for you also to have a league where you're able to go and look at the American players up close, looking at their work rate off the ball, looking at their attitude. I mean, you must have learned a huge amount as a head coach about, about certain individuals from going around the clubs and seeing them firsthand. Yeah, a massive amount. And I think, Greg, you know, one of the, you know, you know, one of the most encouraging things for Hugh and I when we went around was, you know, not, not only you guys, but you know, every single club, every single head coach was really welcoming. Um, again, there was there was there was a, a, a complete sharing of ideas. I mean, you know, we had an open book in terms of what we were looking at, but you know, almost all all, all the clubs shared their information with us. You know, allowed us to attend training sessions, watch footage with you guys, um, have a look at the the data in terms of what you guys were recording on your players and the different intel that you had on your players. And, you know, it all lends to, to a very much better product. And I, and I hope we can, you know, we can offer the same thing back to the coaches and the clubs as well in terms of sharing um, the latest science and the, and the information, the evidence that we're getting back from the game at the moment now. So it, it's, it's in a good place, you know, it's in a healthy place. You know, we know we, we, we by no means um, remotely where we want to be in terms of a league and in terms of a national team. But, I mean, I think we're making good progress, all of us, in the right direction. And more so you guys at, uh, at the MLR level. No, those are great points. And I think you did right in that. If we can just keep the reins on it and keep, you know, salaries for the next five years in relation to the revenue that's being turned over um, and keep working away at those pots in the grassroots level, then it will continue to get better and the standard will continue to get better the, foreign, the standard of the foreigners keen to come over is continuing to get better. Um, and it's, yeah, very exciting to hear you, you guys speaking so passionately about it. 
uh, Gary and Greg. Big, big cheeses on the, on the faces, so we'll move on. Um, let's, let, tell, tell us a little bit about, you know, memories within rugby. We, we were lucky enough, I was lucky enough to have two of the best mentors one could have within the game of rugby. Lucky enough to attend the Rugby World Cup with you two in 2019. Um, it doesn't have to be that, but tell us a little bit about, you know, one of your fondest rugby memories. For me, it was probably in, in Kobe um, in the stadium there with uh, Swing Low Sweet Chariot echoing around the stadium. It was pretty surreal from my end. Um, either that or tiptoeing into your penthouse bathroom, Gary, and taking a two and a half off the, off the corner there. Uh, tell us a little bit about one of your favourite <laughs> memories, mate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Rugby World Cup, obviously, on the field point of view was slightly disappointing for, for you know, how hard we had worked. And, you know, again, on reflection, I think, um, you know, a lot of the things we, we, we did were in the right direction. Unfortunately, we, you know, we failed to pretty much fire a shot at the at Rugby World Cup. And, you know, I, I need to own that. Um, you know, that's completely on my shoulders. And if we had to do it again, I think there would have been a few things we would have done differently. But, you know, I'm just very blessed, hey, Tom. I mean, I've, I've, I've had so many amazing memories. Um, obviously, I've, you know, going to a Rugby World Cup, uh, even even though we were in the pool of, of, of death, as, as they like to call it, it was still an amazing experience. Um, absolutely can't fault our players for the dedication, how hard they worked. Um, that was never, ever really going to be the issue, and I don't think it was at the time. Um, I think we lost to, to better teams on the day, which is unfortunate because... I still think, you know, we were a better team than, than you know, what will be reflected in the record books. Um, and the, hence the reason why I've got such a lot of faith in this group of players. So uh, it, was, it was a wonderful experience, a massive honour as well. Um, it, was my, it was my second World Cup. Um, I went to the other, one, uh, the other one in New Zealand as well, which also ended in disappointment, even though we were unbeaten during the pool stages. Um, yeah, but I've just been very blessed. I've got a lot of memories. Um, Probably, you know, other than, you know, being involved with the U.S. at the moment, the, the, you know, the two outstanding memories are, are um, you know, being, being able to be involved with a, a national team that played against the British and Irish Lions and won that series. Um, I, I think it's fair to say, you know, no matter whose side you were on, it was an epic series. I mean, literally came down to a point or two um, that, that, that was the difference between winning or losing the entire series. Um, and, and, you know, from our point of view, you guys have appreciated having both been involved as Lions, you know, Lions spectators or supporters, depends on which side of the pond you come from. But, you know, the Lions tour is a, is a big deal. I mean, in many circles, often spoken about sometimes a bigger deal than, than Rugby World Cup because for South Africa, Australia, New Zealand comes around only every 12 years, you know, whereas the Rugby World Cup comes around every four years. And, so, you know, to be involved in that was, was huge. And, you know, and then also to be involved in a year where, you know, we, we, we won a Tri-Nations, but also managed to beat the All Blacks three times in a row was, was a big deal. Uh, that hadn't been done in, in, I can't remember, I think 1949 was the last time the All Blacks had lost three tests in a row. You know, and there was, it was a special team of players to be involved with. But you've got to keep perspective about those things because, um for every good day, there's there's many many more worse days, and you know, um, it's 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 a tough job and it's a lonely job many times. But but yeah, I mean, just you know, lots of amazing memories, and everywhere I've gone, I've I could recite a, a special memory or a special victory or a special group of guys that I've I've been I've been privileged to spend time with. You know, so um, whether that was one year going to try and help Newcastle do nine points clear at the bottom of the table and going away to play Gloucester and never having Newcastle had never won at King's home in the professional era, you know, and a team who were bottom of the log beating Gloucester at Gloucester. So, you know, there's so many of these memories, you know, us beating Scotland, you know, we agree was obviously involved in that being the first tier one team that we've beaten, you know, the USA have beaten and, you know, following that up with, you know, not one, but two victories against Samoa. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's exciting stuff. And, and I mean, it, it all boils down to the fact that of getting the pleasure of seeing the players fulfill, you know, their aspirations and being able to, you know, see them work really hard, but then, you know, loving seeing them get the, the joy of, of the hard work paying dividends. And unfortunately, that, that in our world means the scoreboard's in our favour. But playing in many, many games or being involved in many games where we've been the better team and haven't won one on the scoreboard. And, you know, that's just... 
that's the beauty of the game that we play, you know. Uh, we've got to take the highs or the lows and, you know, just, just keep enjoying it. But, you know, very blessed and long may it continue. You mean, Gary, fantastic storyteller, as always, and, uh, and G-banger. Um, mate, tell, tell me a little bit about, you know, to touch on that same topic of, of your favourite memory, but also tell us a little bit about the, the rivalry. Uh, it's a fond rivalry, a loving rivalry between Boston and, and New York, and you've got some brilliant characters down there as well with, you know, the likes of Butch, the likes of Nate Brakely. Tell us about some of the guys who really kind of motivate your day-to-day to come and, and do what you do. It's a great question. I, I think, you know, Gary will say it, so will you. Like, you know, Gary did mention it. Like, we, we coach a lot to see the reaction of players, particularly when they do something that we're, they're proud of as an individual. And we see the glimpses of when they work together and what you've worked on as a group is successful. And, you know, you, you strive for those moments. And sometimes the beauty of this game is it doesn't give it to you all the time. And, it, I, I just had so many amazing, um, honestly, amazing memories. And it's mainly with the people that we built it on. You know, like recently I was, I was WhatsApping Gary. I'd give anything to be back in Colorado. You know, the time that we had was just fantastic as a management group. You know, I miss that. Um, and I miss being around the players, you know, to think of the time they gave up. And we got on so well. But like Butcher obviously was part of that. And, you know, we I always had good banter with Butcher in a national environment, as did Gary, and rightly so. Um, you know, and he's obviously at New York now, and, and um, Nate Brakeley's there as well, who's in the national setup as is Hanko, and Carl Sumption was there before, and Mike Petri was there before. So, you've got a couple of guys who uh, have been around that environment, they just bring back so much experience. And, and you know, certainly, certainly, I think that that's what you look the, for these guys to do uh, in their roles, and the rivalry with. Boston, we need, you know, I mean, the good news is that we're quite open, Tom, um, both clubs, you know, we, um, you know, when it comes time to play each other, you're my least favorite person in the world, but, you know, that's the beauty of the sport. But then after the game is finished, you know, like we did in Vegas, as hard as it was, you know, we played poorly. I didn't prepare my team well enough. I felt I let the guys down. I had to go back to the same hotel as the Free Jacks. We got pounded in that first game in MLR. And next thing you come around the corner after the game and it's like, Jesus, you know, you have to just embrace it, say well done um, and move on. But we need a rivalry. I mean, it wouldn't be the same. We want more rivalries. We want more opportunities for the supporters to get behind it and create excitement. So I think that the older that this league gets, I think you're going to see some brilliant rivalries develop and they'll just bring more crowd and more, uh, more entertainment and we need that. So I'm all for, I'm all for the rivalry with, between Boston and New York. I think, it's, I think it's essential. I reckon there are probably a couple of teams down south too, Gregory, that are putting their hand up for a, with a big target right now <laughs> that we're, we're lining up in the, in the sights. Well, we, we just, we don't worry about that just now. We're worrying about ourselves, but uh you can, yeah, it's, it's exciting. I, I'm really looking forward to seeing where the league goes in the next couple of years. And, uh, you know, yeah. there are some really excited young players coming through as well, which Gary knows full well, who excites Gary in the national team as well. So you have those old experienced players and you're going to see new players come in. That will bring a new energy and you're just trying to continuously build. And, uh, yeah, it's just just good to, good to be on the show talking about, you know, MLR and it's good fun. No, it's, it's been a, been an absolute pleasure having you both on. I appreciate you both busy men, and thank you so much for taking the time, lads, to come and uh, have a chin wag with me, Greg. Uh, you'll be smiling all day, I'd say, after seeing my pretty face. Oh. So, yeah, it's good to see G. I don't uh, we we WhatsApp message a lot, but I always laugh when I see him. So it's great to see you, big <laughs> It is. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. Oh, I do have my lantern too, Greg. I, I know oh, you appreciate here, that, mate. Here so. we go. Here we go. Yeah, and I can do this for you too if you want. Just so uh, you can get a visual on that. Yeah, it's good, man. I'm all for it. Bring it on. What do I say? No, sweet. Hey, any parting words before we uh, we uh, leave Frederick's Nation to uh, see another day? Just want to make sure that you found your Birkenstocks. Did you manage to find them? <laughs> <laughs> I've actually got a... You wouldn't time, believe it. I've got a... Last time I saw your Birkenstocks, they were at... Uh, Shin Hazaru Station, I think, leaving on the next Shinkansen. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, saw you... on stage in amongst prawns in some 
in some uh, bowl beside reception of the hotel. That's where uh, I like if, if, if those birds could talk, they'd have a hell of a story. And, and I'd, I'd say I wouldn't want to hear what they'd have to say either. Um, no. And, uh, no, this, and, and, and then obviously as well, you know, not only from a rugby coach point of view, but Greg is a man of many talents. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think, Tom, on the next, on the next um, Free Jacks Nation podcast, you should Greg, get Greg to do a couple of his renditions. None, none more so than his musical rendition of, uh, of Queen in a Brazilian restaurant. I well, Gary, in fact, I think we both know that I have video footage of me and you in that said Brazilian restaurant singing Coldplay. So I, I have that in the back pocket. I never need to bring that out. Okay. That's good to know, Greg. That's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> good evening, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> But good times, Tom. Yeah, and uh, you guys yeah. are doing you guys are doing great work there in Boston, and um, yeah, amazing to see the enthusiasm. And uh, again, you know, just very lucky. I don't want to single out one club or the other. I mean, Greg's alluded to the fact that I've I've travelled and spent time there with him and Marty, and you know, seen the excitement of what they're trying to do there. And, you know, even just recently being in touch with the, the new guys from Dallas, and it's it's brilliant in LA, and you know the. There's a, there's a real buzz around around rugby in the U.S. at the moment. And um, uh, there's some things that need to be fixed off the field. We all know about that. Um, I don't think that's a secret. And, and we do need to fix it. Hence the reason why I think all of this, there's a lot of tears that are still probably going to be flowing. But, you know, one, once they've dried up, there'll be a, there'll be a good plan going forward. And, um, yeah, thanks to you guys at MLR and everybody, all the MLR clubs, and, you know, keep it going because it's uh, – it's critically important. We're on. It's only up to us to cock it up right now, really, um, because it's on the it's on the track to to going to good good things. So, yeah, well, I think we're in a healthy position at the moment. Absolutely, no, it's a it's a pleasure interacting with so many good people uh, that are around the league and around the USA rugby as well. So, Gary and Greg, thank you so much for your time, and uh, a lot of people will, will learn a lot from uh, listening to the wisdom that you guys have uh, dispelled this afternoon. Fair, and fair play, your to, um, fair play to Gary's point. Fair play. You're doing a great job. Appreciate you having us on. Thanks, guys. Keep it up in New York. And, and Gary, I'll see you soon. Thanks, see you guys. Soon. Take it easy. All the best. It's the top. It's still going. Flick it field. It's champagne rugby from the Free Jacks. Let's ride.